Good morning, folks. I trust you're well. We're seeking a little bit more encouragement throughout these holidays by looking at our Bible reading challenge, which is the Gospel of John at the minute. And we've reached John chapter five. So I hope you'll enjoy as we read along together in that chapter and see what we might be able to pick out for food for thought and perhaps even a bit of encouragement throughout the day. So let's uh, pick that up. It's the Gospel of John and chapter five. It's quite a long chapter. Um, so hopefully we won't make too many comments at the end of it. Um, but we'll, we'll do that just now. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up from Jeru went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Beth Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In there lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath, and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me. That man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who was the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus, Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a, a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son that all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son, does not honour the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and it is now, here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. As for, the fa for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own, as I hear, I judge. My judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears, who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he is born witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you might be saved. He was, burning and he was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me, his voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures, 
because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you. Moses, on whom you set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Amen. This is a great exchange that we have within this passage of scripture. And whether it's a single exchange with all the details there, or whether it's a series of exchanges that Jesus has in the midst of his ministry, because there's so much there where he's saying, truly, truly, this thought, truly, truly, or, or very truly, there's an emphasis there, that thought, this thought, that thought, and so on. Um, he, he makes de defense of himself, really, by showing that God himself is his witness. Uh, John witnessed to him too, John the Baptist, but... The witness that really counts is the one that comes from God. But what's interesting, just before we get into that almost a tirade, is that the, the Jews themselves recognize that Jesus is equal to God. At least the, the claim is there by calling God his father and him the son. And when he then goes on to relate that he is the son of God, it's really only emphasizing and re-emphasizing exactly that thought. And perhaps that's difficult for us to understand in our own day and age, and especially with the kind of turns of phrase that Jesus uses there. Is a son ever as good as his father? Well, the question is whether or not uh, you can be a chip of an old block and, and be equal to your father. You, you're never, um, in, in a sense, preceding your father. Your father precedes you in a human relationship, and that's different again in respect of God, but, but so too. You know, a, a son can can not just equal, but even be greater things than, than his parents, um, or a daughter for that matter either. Uh, the the reality of it is that we, we want our children to do better than us. And we know that in every generation we stand on the shoulders of those before us. But in respects of calling God his father, in this very literal sense, Jesus was actually being noted for, for making that claim that he was equal to God. So some few thoughts there, just to begin with. There's also the question about why is it that Jesus says that he can't do anything of his own accord? But on the other hand, the Father judges no one, and all judgment is given to the Son. What's going on there exactly? How is it the Father's not judge? And yet he's also the one that sent the Son. And I suppose this really comes back down to the different roles that the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit for that matter, have within uh, their role of divinity. That the Father, we would see it probably as doing the planning and, and having plans enacted, whereas the Son, we've seen this before in previous chapters, as the Word spoke out what the words of God and, and made sure that they, these were what actually took place, and particularly in creation. We referred in John chapter 1, the way that let there be light. It was very likely Jesus himself who spoke that as the Son of God, and, and he declared these things, and that's what then happened. And so we see also here that the son has that role of judging. The father isn't the judge. He doesn't do the judging in, in the sense of what Jesus is talking about here. Um, and in fact, Jesus goes one stage further to say that actually people generally judge themselves. But he has a role in here that's unique. So to the Holy Spirit has a unique role as well. Although um, really the purpose of the Gospels is to show who Jesus was. They're not really trying to emphasize the Holy Spirit. In most of scripture, we find that emphasis um, is, is really downplayed. There's almost a humility there in Father, Son and Holy Spirit, for that matter. A humility that we're expected to emulate. Uh, there's also the sense that when Jesus was on earth, he was in a humbled position. If we look at um, Isaiah 53, for example, the story of the suffering servant, which is felt to be a messianic uh, prophecy, we see there that um, the, the servant 
was to be humbled. We see other passages of scripture, we've looked at them more recently in Hebrews, for example, that showed that uh, Jesus would humble himself to come to earth, and then he would further humble himself to be a servant and continue humbling himself, even to suffer death. So whilst he was on earth, he had given up all of his authority at that time. But it didn't change that he was still the son of God, and that when his earthly course was done and that particular servant ministry had finished, he still had a role to take back up once more, which would ultimately include that role of being the judge at the end of time. And we, we spoke briefly into that in uh, Revelation when we were looking at that in our reading challenge as well. And, and this is also found even in the little story we have at the start here. Uh, we, in another place, Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. But he, he tells a man pick up your cot and walk on the Sabbath. And the man immediately is healed. He gets up, he does as he's told, and he picks up the cot and he starts walking. And the Jews condemn him, particularly his Jewish leaders condemn him because he's lifting something and carrying it around on the Sabbath. They, they could perceive that potentially as, as being work. And so he, he was being castigated for it. But Jesus had, has all authority. He, he had every right to, to tell him to do something on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was there so that humankind could have a rest. It wasn't for the sake of God that God made the Sabbath. He made it for our sake. That we would ensure that we had a cycle in life and have an opportunity for rest. A rest that when the, the Israelites were in Egypt, they had no opportunity for as they were working dusk till dawn, seven days a week as slaves in that country. And the Israelites, all of them, should have known that, religious leaders and others besides. It was a well-known uh, part of their historic story and uh, something that was, was intrinsic to their culture. So guess what can we learn from this today ourselves, just casting an eye over it? We have a God who can heal. That's not to say that he always heals and heals every time we ask it, but he, he is uh, powerful to heal. He's a God who can command everything. He's a God who gives us eternal life. And in loving Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we, we have entered into eternal life, we believe. And Jesus really takes up exactly that thought when he's talking to these Jewish leaders who won't listen to him. They refuse to listen to the testimony of his own words, but especially his deeds in the power of the Holy Spirit as these things are being done and, and in the command of the Father in, in ensuring these things do take place. That the healings that he's performing, the, the teachings that he's, he's giving to people, he, he ascribes that all to, to God. And yet these religious leaders completely miss that and they don't really want anything to do with it. They want to actually refute him and, and actually the, the antithesis of what he's uh, producing there. And in fact, I have no doubt that as the letters of John that we looked at recently talked about those who, who heard Christ and heard of Christ and went the other way. They were anti-Christ in that they, they didn't like Christ, they didn't like his disciples, uh, they didn't like Christians, they had, they had no time uh, for him or his. And so we see that even to this day as well. There are those who have this antipathy towards Christianity and they really perhaps need to watch for themselves when they do that. Uh, and that's not a threat. There's a, a reality of, of what's been expressed here, of what people's response to Christ is all about. And again, we saw that when we were looking just a couple of chapters back at that discourse with Nicodemus, who was one of these religious leaders, but one who actually did have a listening ear and was listening to what Jesus had to say. So if we got a, a listening ear, I suppose is the other question, how much are we enamored by Christ? Um, there's also another caution here in verse 39 my eyes just dropped on talking to religious leaders he says you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and it's them that bear witness about me and there's a truth in that you could know scripture from Genesis through to Revelation and every doctrine that's involved in there and every piece of theology it's possible to know and understand but if you miss the point that they're they're bearing testimony to Jesus as the Christ and as the Son of God and all that he's uh, accomplished on our behalf. If you miss that point, you miss the whole point, and you've missed the eternal life that is being offered there in, in Scripture. That, that is exactly the point of, of uh, the, the Scriptures being there, of the nation of Israel having been set apart, that it would point everything towards Christ 
facts that we might find at the right time, in the right place, an answer to our, our primary woes in life and our concerns for not just the immediate future, but our eternal future. And that's something we do well, again, to think about, even in, in tumultuous times such as we're living in at the minute, where nobody really has an awful lot of, um, of either consistency in, in life or particularly any idea what's going to happen next. Uh, there's, there's that ambiguity about what comes next in our lives because at the minute this virus really is taking control of half the world, if not the whole world. So there's much to think about there when we think about our day-to-day -day living and how we follow Christ, not just his teachings, but he himself, who the scriptures bear witness to, but him, the person. So I hope that's helpful as we walk through our daily life today and hopefully we're blessed by it. And let's have a wee word of prayer and get on with that day and uh, we'll see how things go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to this earth for all that you told him, all that you gave to him, uh, all that you've accomplished in him. And we thank you that he took up that challenge and that task willingly even though it was without doubt challenging. And even when people um, opposed him, he still spoke so winsomely, but also spoke so forcefully and authoritatively because all power ultimately was to be his in heaven and in earth for the kind of things that human beings are so concerned with and wrapped up with, our own personal security, our own lives, our own health, and uh, particularly our eternal health. So we thank you that you sent him to make these things manifest. We thank you for all the examples that he gave us and, and certainly all the things that he did that showed that you were testifying to what you had done, what he had done. We pray that as we hold on to that in our own lives, we might be blessed by it and given a confidence that really can come from no other place. Bless us this day, we pray, as we attempt to walk with Christ to the best of our ability. And when we stumble and fail, we ask that you forgive us, but we thank you for that assurance that you give us is to be found only in him. Hear us, please, in, for the sake of the name of Jesus. Amen. I look forward to catching you again tomorrow. We move on to John chapter 6. Uh, but until then, God bless. Take care. Bye for now.